Today is Sunday, September 22nd, 2024. This is episode 280 of the Defensive Security Podcast. My name is Jerry Bell, and joining me tonight, as always, is Mr. Andrew Kellett. Good evening, sir. How are you today? I'm doing great. This is our our second attempt, and hopefully more successful attempt at video. I'm pretty sure that the podcast gods realize that we have faces for radio, and they're fighting Tooth and nail for us to put out video. Let's let's see. Uh, see how it goes. We'll see how this one goes. Yes. We might get ahead enough. of ourselves. Just a reminder that the thoughts and opinions we express on the show are ours and not those of our either future or former or current employers. But for a large enough fee, it could be. It could be all you. <laughs> all right. So jumping into some stories tonight, we have first one comes from the register. The title here is CISA boss makers of insecure software are the real cyber villains. Wow. So Jen Easterly, who is the director. I feel like there should be like, I feel like there should be like theme music or some kind of bu- bumper music. I'll work maybe, on maybe like for next time. The law and order. I, I have to move my, my soundboard over here, but I do have the little sound pads so we could do that. <laughs> anyway. Your summary. Sorry. Anyhow, Jen Easterly is the director of CISA and I was recently presenting at the, I think it's the Mandiant M-Wave com- conference and she had two interesting points. Number one, maybe the controversial, maybe not, but two interesting points. Number one was that. It really does, and and we can debate the veracity of this or whether we agree, but she points out that it really comes down to the makers of software. It's their responsibility to produce software that is secure and, and not vulnerable. She goes so far as to say we should stop calling them vulnerabilities because she thinks that is not really highlighting the significance of them and call them actual product defects. Personally, I, I don't know how that changes a lot. And then the other one, which I actually could agree with the second one a, a little bit is to change the way we refer to and name these threat actors. And so she, she points out that we give them, we as an industry often give them, I don't want to say classy names, but, but interesting sounding names. And different threat intelligence companies have different naming schemes as we've talked about in the past. But her point is that we should be creating derogatory names so that they're, they're not incentivized or people aren't incentivized to, to make a name for themselves in this way. So I think that last one was a little kind of, at least for me, tongue in cheek. I don't Perhaps think the bad, bad actors, idea. I don't think the bad actors are doing it to get a cool nickname. I don't think that's their motivation. I no, I don't think so either, but it's, but. A, it was an interesting add on to the discussion. I think the meat really is this concept that it is on the, the software manufacturers. And I think at one point she makes the comment that you wouldn't get on a plane or, a, or get into a car if you didn't have some level of trust in the software. So why should we let manufacturers off the hook so easily? And I think you've made the comment in the past that if we're going to hold software to the standards of aeronautics or even cars, we're probably, we just have a, I think a disconnect. Yeah. I think that's going to drive costs much higher. And I I really struggle with this one. I made a lot of notes on this story more than any of the other stories on the show today. I understand. I think I understand your point. And as a security leader in a software company. I agree with her take. We should be trying to educate our devs and giving them the tooling and the capabilities and the guidance to avoid these problems. However, I have challenges with blaming 
software companies. Now, again, you could say I'm biased because I work for a software company, but that's not why. I, I, I feel like this is somewhat akin. What, what this conversation is missing is that we have an active bad actor who's attempting to break in. There's, a, there's an active negative influence in it. It's not just, oh, buggy software. It's somebody is exploiting buggy software to get in. That's finding a way in. So this feels to me like if someone breaks into your house, you're blaming the victim of the, for the house burglary because they didn't have enough bars on the windows or enough locks on the doors. Or if a bank is robbed, you're blaming the bank because they're not taking enough steps to stop a bank robbery as opposed to blaming the, the burglar or the bank robber. So we've got bad actors who are out there trying to find weaknesses and that are heavily motivated to exploit them for financial gains. So I go back to the latter part of the, of the article and her position is actually interesting where she starts talking about pushing software buyers to ask for more quality and more security and, and quality secure code practices in their upfront buying decisions, which I don't disagree with. I, I think that's fine, but I don't know if we as an industry actually care. I, I, I've been trying to think about how often we have been willing to give up innovation or cost for security as opposed to pushing the software industry to innovate as fast as possible and as quickly as possible. And competitively, these various software companies are in a bind where if they go slower than their competitors, they don't get purchased because the deciding factor typically is functionality and skill set, not security. It's starting to shift. Look at Gen AI right now. We are all rushing headlong into Gen AI, not slowing down to listen to any of the potential cautions or security. We're like, the hell with it. This does cool stuff. Let's use it. Or Mac versus Windows. How many enterprises choose Windows over Macs for various reasons, cost, but in general, Macs endpoints typically have less security problems. Uh, you can argue why. There's a huge reason for that. It has to do with market share or whatever. But the, if you cared about a secure endpoint, you might drift over towards Mac. But we don't see that much. So that, and, and I wonder how often does an enterprise software purchase actually fail due to a security issue in a third-party risk management or GRC sort of review or reputational damage from an existing. We can look at Move It. We can look at right now CrowdStrike. All these companies that have had massive issues, we'll see you in the, in, the, in the instance of CrowdStrike, but a lot of these other companies have had massive hacks. You look at their stock price a year later, it's the same or higher. So I know I'm like ranting and raving on this one, but I don't know that we as an industry care. So I think if she wants to get her point across, or if she wants to achieve this, she's actually going to have to motivate the buyers, not the manufacturers. Because the manufacturers mm -hmm. are are, are, are responding to the incentive of the market. And that's where I think this will come from, if we care enough. Well, yeah, cer certainly the government, I think, is trying to influence the, the supplier side through their the levers they hold, right? They're large buyers of software. And so they're trying to set minimum standards and, and whatnot, but they are only a subset of the market and, and they can control certain things. My, my observation is that we have, I have observed some companies making changes as a result of that, but I think in large measure, you're right on companies buy on features and price and almost nothing else. And I wonder, we have another story in the stack today, actually, that talks about this, that if I were them, if I wanted to make the biggest swing and move the needle the most, I would insist on MFA before yeah. anything else. Yeah. Some sort of single sign-on, some sort of MFA, some sort of multi-factor, get away from static passwords. That is where I think they would have the biggest bang for the buck. And that's where I think people should, when we look at how often passwords are reused and found in breaches and re you know, that's where we get our problems right now. I'm not saying that software vulnerabilities don't matter, not saying SQL injection doesn't happen or whatever, but that's where we still see the majority of problems. So if they want to focus on one area, that's where I'd focus. Yeah, it, it, there's, there was two other areas that I wanted to, to cover here. Number one is it, it, I think 
oversimplifies the threat landscape a bit because I, I don't have any good metrics at hand, but I, I've been, we both been in the security industry for a long time. My experience has been that the vast majority of actual security problems, actual breaches aren't the result of vulnerabilities in software. They're the result of misconfigurations. They're the result of bad decisions. They're re the result of bad passwords. Now you could say the lack of MFA of forcing MFA, is that a software vulnerability or is that a, an implementation detail that wasn't, you know, addressed correctly by the consumer. And you can have that debate. The one thing I will add though, is in a lot of enterprise software, SaaS software right now, I'm seeing a higher tier subscription cost for SaaS function, for single sign-on MFA functionality. There's a tax that seller is applying for that. And that I've, I'm frustrated by that. Now, sure, it's a free market and you get what you can get and it's worth what people think it's worth. But it's interesting how often I run into that where the functionality that, for instance, my company needs is in the lower tier. But if I mandate SSO or MFA, they have to go to a higher tier that they don't want just to get that functionality. And maybe that's the way the world needs to work, but it is something that is a frustration. Yeah, I, that's a good point. The, the other observation I have is the applicability of this whole notion to open source, right? Open source is becoming, especially under the covers, is becoming a huge component of all sorts of software, including commercial software. And as we've seen in the past, open source has been, in many cases, the, the thing that was vulnerable. Now, I right. personally don't think that you can let the manufacturers off the hook. We've talked about in the past, when you use open source software, you're adopting a puppy. Like you're responsible for the puppy. If the puppy is sick, like it's your puppy. You just, because it's an open source product, doesn't alleviate your responsibilities. But I think that oversimplifies the dynamic. I don't know what the right answer is, but I think, I think at some point the eye of Sauron on this right now is looking at the commercial so software manufacturers, but it, assuming they get them beat into submission, it's going to, it's going to, it's gaze is going to move over to open source. And I don't know how that plays out. Yeah. I, it, it, that's a whole different ecosystem with hobbyists and part-timers and people mm -hmm. doing stuff for free that, I don't know. That is an interesting problem. And I don't know how that's going to play out. I think a lot of open source developers have a great deal of pride and want to do things well and properly and securely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, but I think a lot of people don't understand, as you were saying, how much open source developed by some random person is used in a lot of huge software projects. Yeah. See, yeah. we've seen it lately. It's, it's significant in getting more significant. I'm not going to say getting worse. It's just the magnitude is growing. It's that whole old XKCD comic about how one little tiny piece of open source is supporting this massive infrastructure and when it breaks, it all falls down. What do you do? Do you force, this is a licensing question, but do you force manufacturers to fork everything they want to use and then they own that fork and then they're really not getting the benefit of open source at that point. They're not getting the updates of the community. They're just, it, it gets sketchy in a hurry on that one. Or what do you do? Do you mandate that an enterprise software has to do a software composition and static analysis scan on every piece of open source and, you know, and fix high level vulnerabilities before they can use it and then commit that back to the open source tree? I, I don't know. I mean, I think it comes back to the, uh, one, one of the concepts we've talked about ad nauseum in the past, which is how, how do you rank and, and rate open source, because it's not all created equal, right? We, there's lots of different dimensions you can measure it on how often it's the, the down to the location of the developers. And we've seen instances where bad, bad actors have infiltrated the development team and, 
and by the way, even in otherwise completely mainstream and legitimate open source like OpenSSL and others, we've seen significant vulnerabilities in the past. I don't know how that plays out, but I think at some point it is a it is an issue that we as an is industry are going to have to wrestle with. Yeah. It's not as simple as saying, hey, every enterprise of a certain size needs to hand code all their own stuff. That's not viable. That again drives no. back to massive costs, very slow innovation, very slow release to market, and the market forces will put them out of business. So that's not going to work. I don't Absolutely. know. That's a tough one. Maybe there are some folks out there with some ideas that maybe someday we'll talk to in some other mystery format that may be on the horizon. It could be. That sounds like a teaser. That's an ominous foreshadow. All right. Our, our next story comes from the Tenable blog. And the title here is Cloud Imposter Executing Code on Millions of Google Servers with a Single Malicious Package. This was a, a presentation that was given at Black Hat this past summer. And just to cut to the, the chase, they didn't actually execute code on millions of servers. It was more that they could have if they chose to. It was an interesting nuance, I guess I'll call it a vulnerability slash misconfiguration that kind of went fairly deep. So the issue here is dependency confusion, which is not a new concept. It's a, it's a pretty old concept. Kind of also in the open source problem we've been talking about. It absolutely is. So this was, or I think it's been fixed now. It was an issue with Google's use of their code pipeline that they offer to customers. And there's a, a particular package called Apache Airflow, which has 22 million downloads a month. So it's a very significant piece of code. And it has the ability to, to use a particular, particularly problematic command line option, which allows you to not only reference private artifact repositories, but also public repositories. And that's where the problem comes in. And, and so if you as a developer are using this service and you have a set uh, of libraries in your private repository and you follow the instructions as provided by Google to include this command to look at the public Python repositories, it opens up you up to the potential that an adversary who would have, who might happen to know the names of the, the libraries that you're using, which is not impossible to find out, depending on the thing that you're building, they can create a, a malicious library. And as long as they're using, they're, they're calling it a version that is ahead of the version, the legitimate version that you have in your private repository. That is the version that your system or that your application will pull in and execute. And so the, I think that the concern was less on the novelty of this and more on the potential magnitude, the fact that this is a very old and well understood problem, not in regards to Apache Airflow, uh, not in regards to Google, but it points out that what is old is new again. And if we're not careful like this, we can really, we can really trip. And I think what made this particularly bad was that it was explicitly included in the documentation provided by Google, that this is how you should configure your system, which would open you up to the vulnerability and you know, the, the, I think the, the authors of this were really trying to hammer on the point that, look, we have to, as an industry, do a better job of understanding where these kinds of problems can exist and make sure that we're not, we're not perpetuating them in new kinds of environments like this. It's super obscure in my mind. This is so deep down the rabbit hole of, mind you, very impactful, but really obscure of, hey, one command line in one script saying, Oh, by the way, don't just check my private repo, check the public repo. Right. Uh, and if it's a, a newer version, go grab that one. That's right. so what seems like a minor thing could lead to such a massive problem. 
uh, and s- requires such a level of attention to detail that we've got to be very careful. And that's the, the takeaway for me is one little misconfig like this, and you open yourself up to such a massive issue that could come bite you bad if you're not careful. And yes. I feel like this is a lot of dominoes had to fall pretty right for this to be exploited, but it's interesting. And I think it's a good call out to your own software development environments of what do you trust? Are you, are, is anybody even thinking about this? Are they thinking about what repos you're looking at and what dependencies you're pulling in and how do you know they're valid and how do you know they're the right ones and the appropriate ones? And how often do you pull them? How often do you check them? It, it's a lot of like really boring slog work, but boy, are we seeing more and more instances of people trying to pollute and use these public repositories as a place to launch malware. So I see more and more stories over time as that being an interesting attack technique that I don't know gets a lot of press or at least a lot of airtime or a lot of headspace of people as a legitimate attack vector. I think it's definitely growing. It's the, it's what all the cool kids now call supply chain attacks. And I think it makes, makes the, it makes a lot of our processes to enumerate and track libraries a little more difficult because, or both more difficult and more important because you may, depending on how you're keeping track, you may not, you may not really be aware that this is. A, a potential problem. And so I have to wonder if you were a, an otherwise diligent develop developer slash development shop and your tool suddenly sh- threw an error that there was some issue with a dependency, you know, would, would you be astute enough to recognize that, Hey, like you, you pulled in something malicious or would you assume that the tool was wrong? Would you assume it was a false positive? I, I think most developers are developers first and they're not suspicious like us crotchety old yeah. security people. And it's just a bug they got to fix. Right. It's, Indeed. Yeah. I don't know. It's interesting. I also wonder, you mentioned like software bill of materials. You may be doing your due diligence saying, yeah, it's using this version from this repository, but not realize you're actually pulling from another one. Exactly. Yeah. That can be tricky. Exactly. You know what? Software is just too hard. We should just stop. We should just let AI do it. That's right. It knows better. All right. Our next story comes from CNBC and the title here is Disney to ditch Slack following July data breach. So July, sorry, Disney was fairly famously the victim of a data breach a couple months ago. and. Lots of different data types were, were stolen, um, but apparently it was largely from their, their Slack system. I thought what was most interesting was not necessarily the breach itself, but the way the two companies are posturing themselves in response to the breach. So you, on the one hand, you have Disney saying we were breached. It was a bad, it was a bad thing. They had to disclose it to their shareholders and I don't know exactly how much harm that has come to them, but they have now announced that they're going to be moving off of Slack and onto some internal collaboration tools. They don't go into detail on what they're moving to. But then there's a quote from the CEO of Salesforce who owns Slack, basically asserting, Hey, our stuff is very secure and customers need to own up to the responsibilities they have for also being secure including making sure that their employees aren't fished. Which implies a whole lot. Yes, implies <laughs> a whole lot. It was echoes, it was obviously not as exciting, but echoes of the Delta slash CrowdStrike slash Microsoft debacle from a, a couple of months ago. Which has apparently quieted down. I think the lawyers got distracted with something else. I'm waiting for the next volley of attack. Yeah, I think now it's everybody's in the middle of court filings. So I think they're going to calm down for a little bit. So we don't know how Disney exactly got hacked. They haven't. You can infer. You can infer. infer. And the scuttlebutt I've heard 
Like the rumor that I've heard, or the most likely is, which with what typically happens is an endpoint or an employee was fished or in some way had a social engineering attack start at the endpoint. And then the bad actor moved lateral into Slack and scraped apparently 1.1 terabyte of data out of Slack. What frustrates me a little bit about the story is it's not Slack's fault that this happened. And it's implying that Slack is a problem here. There's also this sort of like interesting corporate speak of, we were already planning to move away from Slack. And then somebody was maybe thinking Microsoft Teams might be where they're going. And I'm like, oh, you poor people. I'm, I weep for your future. But aside from that. It's going to be way better. <laughs> but I'm not sure that fixes the problem, right? The problem was not Slack. The problem was how much data was available to that employee when they were successfully attacked and how were they successfully attacked and what defenses were lacking there. Slack is too available. Like the data set in Slack is too available. That's a choice by the Slack administrators of the company. And so I don't know, I'm struggling with this. That's like saying, hey, somebody got into our file shares and copied all the files out. So we're ditching file shares. Well, that's not the problem. That's not. It's not going to solve your problem next time if we're just moving to another version of that that has the same security settings and the same permissions and the same identity management and the same data access controls just in a different tool. Bad actors are going to go there and get the same thing, assuming the same attack happens. So I don't know. It's weird. I, 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 maybe there's another reason. Maybe this is some folks kind of putting dots together that don't connect. But and then, mind you, I'm no fan of Slack or Salesforce. I'm not a defender of theirs, but I'm against them either. But I just don't know that this actually solves the problem. The one thing I will say, and I'm less, I'm much less familiar with Teams. Uh, I'm quite familiar with Slack. And I came from an environment that used Slack uh, quite heavily. One of the challenges that we always wrestled with was that channels, when you create a, a, a group Slack, it's open within your enterprise by default. You actually have to take a, an extra step to turn it private. It's unclear to me if that's an administrative level seven setting. You know, it, you can't, unfortunately, once a channel is private, it's not possible to make it public. One could imagine that having a setting where every channel you make be private makes it you know, basically makes it such that you can't have a public channel. Every channel that you would have would require you to be invited. And so there was always a, a, a bit of a arms race to make sure that people were only sharing information, you know, confidential information in channels that had, that, that were, that were private. And, and so I don't know if that's perhaps a, a driver, but I, I think your point is valid that the employee, unless they were in fact the Slack administrator, had access to way too much stuff. If, you, if they pulled off a terabyte right. of data from Slack, holy cow. That, that is what's implied by the articles we're seeing. Yeah. So take with a grain of salt. We don't know that to be 100% accurate. The other thing that I'm aware of is that you do have some interesting options if you go to the top skew level of Slack. They have something called Enterprise Grid. That mm -hmm. gives you like DLP and integration and more policy control integration and SIM integration and a bunch of other things where you could apply the typical controls that we do elsewhere in the environment uh, into a Slack environment. And I don't know a lot of people pay for it. Again, we go back to that's again, more expensive for more security controls, but that's not the only thing it offers. It does a bunch of other things too, but that's something that maybe would have made sense if they had a DLP solution integrated with Slack, maybe they would have noticed this one user copying, in theory, 1.1 terabyte out of Slack over time. That's a good point. A if it all came point. from Slack. Absolutely. But I, it's a little irritating when you see the, the back and forth. And I, I, I think it certainly paints Disney in a bit of a bad light when you have the CEO of Salesforce coming out and, and in making a statement like what they just did measured in how you position the, the cause of your breaches. I, I would love to find out exactly what happened and maybe someday we yeah. will.
Perhaps. So the, the next story is from Cyber Security Dive. And the title here is Bailout Accounts Remain Top Access Point for Critical Infrastructure Attacks, Officials Say. So CISO, uh, the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Administration, which I really still do not like that name, but nobody asked me, has attributed two in out of every, ever, excuse me, let me try that again, two out of every five successful intrusions to a valid account. So basically they're saying 40% of attacks, successful attacks of critical infrastructure have involved someone compromising in some way, a legitimate user ID. And so this kind of goes back to my point that not all hacks are necessarily software vulnerabilities, although software vulnerabilities can result in a breach that then involves credential theft as part of the lateral movement. So hard to, to put a clean box around it. But the, I think the net point is that we as an industry, especially in sensitive places like critical infrastructure, still struggle pretty mightily with just the basics of IAM. And again, I, it, it, every one of these is, I'm sure, its own story. But at a macro level, you might, and, and certainly in my mind, say, what the hell are we doing in 2024 having 40% of breaches involving stolen credentials? Do we not have multi-factor authentication technology available to us to mitigate more of this? I know that you can't fully mitigate it. There's lots of edge cases on, on, on how these texts can, can propagate, but like it, it just, anyway, I'm, I'm having a moment. As you have your ear stroke, I agree that uh, this goes back to what we were saying on the first story. We have better technology that mitigates this problem. It's just not being used. Now, you're right. There's probably a lot of mitigating reasons. There's probably a lot of, well, this is critical infrastructure. How much is this a SCADA? How much is this is people who are not very technical, who are working on pipelines all day, that that's their skill set, not computer skill set. And, and how many shared accounts are being used? And one login that's passed amongst people, et cetera, et cetera. It's a pain in the butt to do security properly. And I bet that's why a lot of this exists, but that's a shame. That's such an easy solve. That's a very mature technology. And it's, I think if you can get a good SSO MFA in an organization and enforce it well across everything that you can, that solves so many common breach problems. It yes. just stops so many attack avenues. It doesn't make it perfect, but it stops so much. I, I really feel like it's one of the strongest things you can do. And this article, I think, reinforces that. It's such a low-hanging fruit problem. We have people who give up their passwords all the time through phishing and social, uh, or social engineering. We have people who reuse passwords and they get dumped to breaches and then are tried and just Get away from passwords. And I know that was tough to do a long time ago. It's not tough now. It's mm. just a matter of will and focus in these organizations. So you're right. There's probably a great reason, a great excuse. There's probably really good stories as to why all these companies got to this point. But at a macro level, to your point, it's very frustrating to see. Yeah. And this is not, by the way, this isn't talking about the corner store, right? These are critical infrastructure companies. Now I will say the, the definition of critical infrastructure can sometimes be contorted to include things that you, one might not generally include in that, but this is not necessarily lower tier unsophisticated companies. These are companies that should be more careful because they presumably know their place in the ecosystem of society and in, in their country. And there was another, was another point in here, which was, I think highlighted that problem of the lack of multi-factor authentication, which is that one in 10 critical infrastructure intrusions was the result of brute force or password cracks in 2023. That's sad. 
But speaking of critical infrastructure, you'll be happy to know that I did get authorization for OnlyFeed, your OnlyFeed account, to be declared critical infrastructure. So yes. you're going to get, yes, you're going to get first response for getting power backup, water cooling. You'll be getting- That's fantastic. You're unemployed now, so your feet- I know, I know. I need, I need that income. It's so important. It's true. It's true. So um, important. So you know, we, we have been getting some more interesting requests for some more niche use of your feet that we'll discuss offline that don't know you're going to be so agreeable. So this sounds bad. This sounds really bad. Maybe we mm -hmm. should move on to the next story. That's fair. Which also comes from CNBC. Last like we just got us demonetized on YouTube. Carry on. Yeah. Damn it. Okay. The title here is Companies Face risk of huge fines and suspensions under tough new cyber rules in the EU. I got to be honest. This is the first I heard of this one. Like, yeah. I, this would have gotten more press. Maybe I just have not been following the right news sources. But this sounds Yeah. I, I, so I, I, I was in my former role. This was definitely squarely on, on the radar. Certainly it's much more applicable to companies who operate and provide services inside, inside the EU. It is not applicable to everybody, but there was a, there was a, a, a law passed or regulation directive. I, I, they all have specific meanings in the EU. I think these are directives that NIS is network information security, network and information security directive was passed a couple of years ago and it was really intended to start improving, uh, the realm of security. And it was, I thought, I always thought of it as the complement to GDPR. So GDPR was about data and personal privacy and NIS was really focused more on infrastructure. However, I don't think it worked out in, in, in any way how the government there thought it would. And so they passed this new. NIS two, which it builds on top of the initial NIS and is really intended to accomplish a couple of things. I would say first and foremost, to force organizations to disclose when they are the victim of an attack or quote cyber within, incident within 24 hours, which is within 24 hours. It's pretty aggressive. And then also to to prescribe certain types of risk management security programs. So much like GDPR and some of the other regulations in the EU are technology agnostic. They don't say you have to have DLP or you have to have, they basically say you have to you use state of the art security controls. It's, it's a very similar concept here, but what is different, I think what, where this deviates from you know, most other parts of the world, you know, they, they've modeled the sanction structure after what they've done with GDPR. I, if you are a critical infrastructure company and you're found violating NIS2, you can be subject to a 2% of your total global revenue fine, or I think it's 10 million euros, whichever is the lesser amount. Higher. Or higher, sorry, whichever is the higher yeah. amount. That's right. And non, then they have non trivial, non trivial. Yeah. Then they have a second tier, which is, I think they call them essential companies, which are it, the critical infrastructure would be like power companies and whatnot. The essential companies are like food manufacturers and transportation companies and whatnot. So they have, they're also covered by this, but their fine structure is a little bit, but a not, but not a lot less. So they, they still have a strong motivation to comply. One of the, both with this and the GDPR, I, on, on the one hand, I think it's interesting and, and, and to some extent good to see a government trying to do the right thing. However, in, with regard to the GDPR, I'm not sure that it's, panned out the, in many way, right, ways that it's panned out the way it was intended. And I think there's a lot of different reasons for that. Different companies have found that they can shop regulators. They can look around. And so lots of 
companies, you know, famously like Facebook and, and others go to Ireland because Ireland's data privacy regulators is, I think a little less strict than some of the others. And, and my, I guess my concern with this is that it becomes another bit of bureaucracy that just drives business to consulting companies and whatnot and and might not necessarily move the needle. I hope it does. And so don't take my commentary as I, I think this is, I, my observation was in the aftermath of GDPR, like the big thing that changed was that people had to, or companies had to go off and hire their own data protection staff or focal point and security and privacy vendors were just having a field day. And so if you actually go and you search on your favorite search engine, I wasn't going to, I was going to say Google, but it's verboten in some places for NIS too. Like the thing that you find is just page after page of consulting companies and technology security companies offering to sell you crap to comply with NIS too. And, and so I come back to, I am concerned that we're, that we're it, companies are focusing on the market opportunity and not on the obligation or not on the intention. That's the way it is always is regulations always. I've never seen it not yeah. be that way. I mean, Fair. look at any like, taxes are a perfect example of that, you sure. know, uh, I also, I think you're a little bitter because the defense of security lobbyists weren't able to get into the law, the requirement to listen to our show. And I know you wanted that. I understand that you were trying to. We tried. We had, juice look, numbers, me, right? look, I tried. I tried. I think we should be happy with system still forcing their prisoners to listen to us as, you yeah. know, I think that's the win. I think we need to just be happy with that one for now. Maybe the coma patients won too, but. Anyway. Yeah, what frustrated me about this article is it didn't really go into any detail at all about what what NIS2 is measured against. It's and how viable and realistic are those? And I should go do some more research. What I also fear about these regulations, honestly, is what I see happen a lot with PCI, and that companies will go to the letter of the PCI law that makes the QSA happy and not a step further. And they're like, and what these are meant to be is minimum baselines, but they become, that's our goal. That's our target. We just have to pass that and we're good to go. And so it's artificially creates in my mind, a floor that it's easy for executives to point and say, I'm only going to invest in security to get to that point and no farther. Um, and how quickly do regulations like this, mind you, this one isn't very prescriptive. I'm picking up PCI because it's a little more prescriptive. How quickly do those update? for dealing with new threat categories. Not very. I don't know. Uh, there's a pro con here. A lot. We've had a few articles today about government trying to push companies to be more secure, which we live and breathe this stuff and we see it every day. And I, I see that, but I will be honest. My bias is that typically government regulations rarely work the way they expect them to work and typically make things worse. Not everybody agrees with me. That's okay. We'll see what happens. Yeah, I, I will say, I don't expect this to be the end of the road. I will expect to see NIS three at some point because look, it's a, it's a rapidly moving space. The threat landscape is constantly changing. And I think that the EU government is learning with every iteration of this. And so I, I, my expectation is that they're going to take stock of what improvements and, and badness, if there is any that comes out of the implementation of this law, and then probably will fold that into something new. But it, I think for one of the, one of the challenges I saw as a leader in a global company is the, how best to describe it, the variation, right? Like you, you have NIS with some prescription and you have Australia also very very prescriptive about security requirements for critical infrastructure. The U S is, I think a little bit, except for power where you have NERC and FERC and, and whatnot, but globally you have this groundswell of regulations around security 
and they aren't necessarily harmonized. And I think one of the challenges I saw and, and frustrated me greatly was that in some instances, these regulations start to conflict with one another, especially when you start looking at things like data protection regulations as, as opposed to security regulations. Like I remember one of the big hooplas we had was the government wants you to a cloud provider, keep track of who you're letting onto your cloud because you don't want bad actors. You don't want North North Korean military people signing up to your cloud service to, to launch attacks against the U S government. Super dumb example. But at the same time, in order to perform that assessment, you have to collect data that would otherwise not be necessary to deliver that service. And therefore you're running against the spirit of regulations like the GDPR. And so it goes. And I, I think if you are a smaller organization that is you know, geographically isolated or limited, it's a simpler problem. But if you're a multinational company that has to comply with regulations around the world, especially if you're in a regulated industry like finance or some sort of regulated technology space, it's maddening. And I yep. sincerely hope at some point these regulators can get into a room and figure out how to work together. And not just like the, the critical infrastructure security regulators. I'm talking about like the banking regulators should be talking to the, to the cybersecurity regulators and they should be talking to the data privacy regulators because they're all different sides of the same dice, right? They're not distinct things. And if we keep pretending like they are, we're going to make, we're going to make it really hard for companies to do what we actually want them to do. There's a couple of outcomes. You'll get a lot of consultants getting a lot of money. You'll get a lot of lawyers getting a lot of money. And then no matter what happens, a company will be in violation of some law when something goes bad. Yeah, I agree. I don't know what the right answer is, um, but I, I feel like sometimes we're on the wrong set of rail tr railroad tracks here. I, I often feel like this is the result of this urge to just do something, quote unquote, that regulators just need to regulate to fix the problem and do something. And I don't know. Yeah. I'm cynical about government regulation. You I, know that. I know. I don't, I don't necessarily fault them. I think, unfortunately, a lot of companies won't take action and not universal, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of companies won't take action unless they are compelled to do so by the threat of a fine. Yeah. And yep, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. But in doing that, you then take companies who might otherwise have been, you know, self-starting and diligent, and now you've put them into the same box and they're, you're basically, I think, forcing everybody to be at a common maturity level. And if that maturity level isn't set correctly, then we're going to have continue to have problems. Yeah, and that maturity level is going to change against the threat landscape. Yes. So. Yes. I don't know. It's a tough one. I get the concern. Like if we're looking at critical infrastructure in the U.S., for instance, I don't want, I don't want my water company to be hackable, and we've seen evidence of that. We've seen of that. That can cause massive casualties. So I get it. I just, I don't know if. I don't know the right way to fix the problem, but I know there's a problem. And that's where I think the regulators are like, hey, we're trying to do something. So it's better than nothing. So I can't fault them there. Yeah. So, All right. That exhausts and on that cheery, our... On that cheery note, on that optimistic note. It, it ensures that we have a, we have jobs for many years to come, or at least that's the thought. Indeed. And hey, oh. I think we got through the entire show without any of our tech breaking this time. Sweet. At least until we find it and post. That's right. All right. Thank you all for watching and listening now that you can watch. And we certainly appreciate your time and attention. Hopefully you found this useful. If you like the show, give us some love on 
whatever venue you're watching this, if it's Apple Podcasts, if it's Spotify, YouTube, whatever, please hit that, hit the like button. You can subscribe as they say. Anyway. You can, you can follow Mr. Kellett on socials where? Formerly Twitter, currently X, at Lurg, L-E-R-G, and on your fine Masseton instance in the Fediverse, Infosec.exchange, at Lurg, L-E-R-G. Sweet. And by the way, I shout out, I've noticed quite a few new signups on Infosec.exchange referencing mm-hmm. the podcast. Is wow. the reason they is the reason they joined. So are welcome, they signing up to are they signing up to yell at us though? You well, know what? It doesn't I, matter. Subscribers are subscribers. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Anyway, you can find me on infosec.exchange. It's at, at Jerry at infosec.exchange. And if you have any, if you're curious, give it a shot. It's, it's similar in some ways to Twitter. It's not Twitter. Just be aware it is not Twitter. But it's a, it's a pretty neat community. We have, we have about 15,000 active security people on our instance. There's a, probably another 10 or 12,000 active security people on other instances that you can all communicate with. So good community, lots of great people. I love it. And anyway, thank you again. And we will talk again real soon. Take care, everybody. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Bye.